Thank you. 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 And the pride, I mean, I have as a filmmaker, seeing Lynn do this kind of work on his debut. I mean, Woo! that does not look like a debut film. That is... I have been to Chicago, so that's... <laughs> no, but that's, that, that is a masterful, masterful job, Lynn. It is exquisite. <clears throat> it is so personal. It's so authentic. It's so deep, and you feel it in every frame. It is so gorgeous to watch. And I don't know if you felt that sort of the personal connection to this man, this beautiful man who we lost much too early, but the connection from you through him, it, it, it's sort of like it's perfection. It's perfection mm. to see all that come together like that on your first film. It's, it's, it's exquisite. So I, I guess the first question really is, <laughs> How did this happen? I mean, how did you, why? I mean, it seems so perfect now, but coming off of who you are, what you do, I mean, I know Lynn is a great actor, so I worked with Lynn as an actor. So, but coming off of all that you do, what took you to directing and what took you specifically to this, this project? Yeah, well, um, first of all, thank you. That's very kind. And, and I, I always want, I want to quote that 1980s drug commercial where it's like, where'd you get this? And I want to be like, you all right? I got it from watching you. Um, because a lot of that's, that's very true to a large extent. Um, the film was my first love. I always wanted to make movies when I was a little boy. And my grandfather owned a video store, Miranda Video in Vega, uh, Puerto Rico. And I applied to schools hoping to, I, I loved theater and I loved film and I wanted to do both. And I only applied to schools that let you double major, like major in both. And so I ended up at, where, this is the director's talk, right? Okay, I'm gonna go real deep. So like, I fell in love with Wesleyan because of the film department, because of Janine Basinger, who runs the film department at Wesleyan. I snuck into her Hitchcock class uh, as a pre-frosh when I was visiting the school. And she looked around, she made eye contact with me and said, some of you are not supposed to be in the seniors only course. <laughs> However, this is such a rare print of Otto Preminger's Bunny Lake is Missing that if you have the opportunity to watch it, you should and not kick anyone out. And we watched this amazing Otto Preminger movie that is not seen very often. And the class that was supposed to be from 1 to 4 went to 5.30 because the discussion was so good that... Uh, People just didn't leave the class, and I was like, this is where I want to be. And I almost missed my bus back to the city because uh, the class went on so long. And then the practical realities sort of sunk in of, like, you have to pay for your own senior film. Um, I, I knew I didn't have them. I knew my parents were killing themselves just to pay for college. And I knew that the theater department pays for your shows if you mount them, and you have to pay for your own films. And so I, I took enough classes to declare, but then I was like, I, I need to leave with stuff. I was feeling very Nina Rosario-ish. I needed to <laughs> leave with more than a degree under my arm, and so um, I became a theater major. But really since Hamilton, you know, I just wanted to get close to the people who were good at making musical films. And that began with you, with working on Mary Poppins. And Julie O, oh, my, my brilliant producer, who had the idea to turn this into a film. I always loved the show, but she she's the one who went and got the film rights. Um, contacted me while I was on set with you. I was in London with you working on that. And so um, I really took that as an opportunity to watch you work because I was midnight at the Ziegfeld uh, <laughs> on Friday for the premiere of Chicago. And the way you blew the roof off the place with this That's movie. Just blown off here. Woo! Um, you know. like, people were like, where did you get the idea for the Cheetah Rivera cameo? I was like, Chicago! <laughs> Because I remember the way everyone went insane seeing Cheetah in that prison. And wow, I, she's, yeah. Yeah, she's, she's the queen. <laughs> she's the queen. <laughs> so, so, you know, I learned so much from being on the set and the way you talk to actors and, um, and, and the way you... But it's you, Lynn. It's your instinct. It, it, you, I mean, I think you paint pictures in everything you do as an actor, as a writer, as a composer. It's, it's the same thing. It comes from you. You're such a, I mean, John and I talk about this all the time. You're such an open vessel. You're so authentic in a, in a sort of a world full of not authentic people. 
That's just who you are. And so, I, I mean, I was surprised, but not surprised. I was thrilled and more proud than surprised. Because when you watch it, 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 is, it is seamless. And, 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 and I actually, I want to ask you a quick question about the framing device of the film. Because, because to me, that's genius. The fact that you start on a stage so that you accept the fact that they're singing and then integrate it into the scene work and you immediately are, it's not that creepy thing that you feel when you watch a musical and they start singing. It is so integrated into it. And that was genius. Where did that come from, Lynn? Uh, well, a couple of things. One, there was a running joke between me and my, my DP, Alice, where she was like, if you had your choice to shoot this entire thing on VHS, you probably would. <laughs> a maniac. And I, I would. I love, I love the feel of the VHS uh, Betamax feel. I think us theater kids have a, a relationship to that kind of footage that's actually like the way we see our most cherished memories. Like, I have VHS memories of the school play. Like, there's a, there's a relationship I have to that. Um, that frame, and that was also my relationship to John himself performing the work. I have a grainy VHS of Jonathan Larson performing Boho Days for an hour mm. uh, on my, you know, in my, on my digitized on my computer, and so um, to use that as the way in, like literally the way I know him. Yeah. Um, so we see Andrew come on, but it looks like it's documentary footage, um, and then just get you to know him a little bit. Um, and this is something we really found in the edit, because the original, in, in the original script, we just kind of went from the New York Theater Workshop into the theater, and then he started telling us the story. But we realized everyone needs to be on the same page. And there are those of us who know Jonathan Larson's story and know that he fretted so much about turning 30 um, and sadly would never reach 40. Um, and I think we, we all needed to have that. Uh, I need to find the most elegant way to get everyone in the audience of like, this is a real person, this is him telling his own story, except for the stuff that he exaggerated, <laughs> and, um, and his version of events is better because he's gonna burst into song. Like, let's let him go. And so then the first time we go to like the film proper is him starting to play piano. Well, it's exquisite, Lynn, because, you've, it's, it, because it, you're, you give the license then to sing, and then for the rest of the film, but I mean, everything is approached with such originality, are so Beautiful. I mean, just even the boho song is so incredible. That's just you know with the rhythm and, and I mean playing on Josh. I know it's fantastic. <laughs> but then all of a sudden you're in. You're in. It's, yeah. it's it's just it's just it's just stunning, Lynn. What about what about the fact that you had been as an actor been in Tic Tac Boom? Um, well, that was incredibly helpful to me too. I you know I uh, that was that production was directed by by Oliver Butler, who went on to direct What the Constitution Means to Me, and I got to do it with Karen Olivo, and Leslie Odom Jr. It was it was like an amazing two weeks, and it was it was a weird time in my life too. I was super pregnant with Hamilton because <laughs> um, we were starting rehearsals four months from that Tick Tick performance, so I, I had that in my brain and no one else had it yet except for my collaborators. Uh, we had gone from the workshop right into Tick Tick. Um, I was performing with my co-star from Heights and my future co-star for Hamilton. Wow. So it was like this weird middle point in my life. Wow. My wife was super pregnant with Sebastian, my first child. So it was just sort of this weird moment where like, I was just waiting for everything to happen. Um, and that's, ex and, that's, and I was also like, just on the outer age of being too old to play <laughs> on the verge of turning 30. And so, and so it, was, it just came along at a perfect time in my life. And um, I learned um, about as much piano as I made Andrew learn, which is like play the way into 3090 and learn the opening figure, learn um, just the opening of why, like learn just enough to be able to kind of um, get into the songs. Um, but, but, but really the biggest legacy from that was meeting Jonathan's community, because I stepped from backstage to the post-show reception, and hi, I'm Matt O'Grady, I'm the bassist for Michael. Hi, I'm Jenna Charleston, I was Jonathan's girlfriend. Hi, I'm, you know, it was, uh, Jonathan's parents were both still alive, uh, Nan was still with us then. And so, you meet these people for whom, um, Jonathan is very much still alive every time Tick Tick is performed, and, and, and it's a much um, less complicated relationship to Tick Tick than it is to Rent, because you know when Rent happened, it happened at the same time as his death, and they had to make all these impossible, heart-wrenching decisions about this 
thing that was happening, but Tick Tick is John writing about his community in, a, in without with much less pretense of fiction on top of it, and so they just kind of get their Johnny back, and and so I knew that that was a resource I could lean on in the making of this film, and so I went and sat down with Janet, and I sat down with Matt, and just got, give me stories, give me what he was like in rehearsal, give me what he was like when he was a total pain in the ass, <laughs> like just all of it. Um, it was so so it was so in your blood. That's what's so beautiful. I think great art comes from that. It sort of just came from you. It was so obvious that it's, you know, that's why it's so masterful. I'm sorry, it is masterful from beginning to end. Um, so, Andrew, we have to talk about Andrew. Yes! But because Woo! that performance is off the charts. It is, I mean, <laughs> we all know he's a great actor. We didn't know he could do that. Right. And did you know he could do that? Yeah, well, I saw him in Angels and I thought he can do anything. <laughs> Truly, I, it was such an incredible performance in Angels in America, and um, what was amazing to learn was that there was a great singer in there too, and someone like closed the valve on it too young. Like someone said, you can't sing to him at a time when it was formative, and so he was like, I don't sing, um, which is insane because he's, yes, great. Because. he's a guru. Right. Yeah, and I, I told, he is a great. Yeah, no, I, I told you the story. The first time we read through. The script, um, it was really early days. This was two years before starting filming the movie. I just wanted to hear the script. And I said, you don't have to sing. We're just gonna like learn all the songs. I'll sing John's parts for now. Um, and like you'll sing when you feel comfortable so singing. And I just, we did it on 175th Street in Washington Heights because I didn't want the word to get out. I wanted to be like, is Andrew Garfield singing in Ripley Greer? Um, you know, I wanted to be very low key. So we did it in my neighborhood and um, every time I would sing John's parts, I would just see Andrew like this, <laughs> just like, ah. <laughs> like he was dying to sing, but wasn't allowed. Like mm. there was some in invisible like fence. Um, and so at lunch, I sort of said, okay, Andrew, like let's just pick three spots because you're dying to sing and you just won't admit it. Um, because I can see your face every time someone else is singing your part. <laughs> um, and so I think we circled Boho Days. I made him mm. sing Boho Days because he didn't have to worry about being on key. It's acapella. <laughs> I had him sing Sunday because everyone in the room was singing Sunday. And so he could just kind of hide in the choir. Like just three points where he could just kind of like sing <laughs> and not make it a thing. I think some people like, if you tell them early enough that they can't, like it, you, you lock it off. And, and so it gets unexplored. And what was amazing in the two years of the run up to this was watching him kind of find this new chamber in wow. himself and watch it. Because it was like, it was not like someone who thought he could sing and couldn't really sing. Right. Like he had no bad habits either. You know, he was really kind of learning from but scratch. It's so free, Lynn. It's so, I mean, it just seems, I don't know, it's, it, it, it's so born in him. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's stunning. Yeah, well, he's, he's, he's a very musical guy. He's fearless, yeah. obviously. Yeah. Tell us about the Delacorte in the rain, in that piano. I mean, I, I, that, that, I mean, <laughs> the film just is breathtaking. It, you just, it, it just sort of, it all sort of comes together in the most simple, beautiful, deep, heartfelt way. Yeah. What was that like? We were all night in Central Park. The walk to Central Park was sort of all day, then we broke until night. Uh, to film the night part. And you will appreciate this because um, <laughs> I, I kind of tried to pull a Rob Marshall on him and it failed. Um, uh, no, 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 in, in the best way, which was I only had the Delacorte until a certain date and then they were starting their season in the summer. And so I couldn't film past, I think it was like March 4th or something. Um, and then they were going to start to tech and then I lost the Delacorte. And so um, what I pitched him was Listen, when I worked on Poppins, the first thing we did was the animated sequence. And that was really big and scary, but then I had it out of my head and it was great. And he was like, what do you mean we're doing why <laughs> the first week? Like, how could you do this to me? Like, that's very intense. And, and I said, I know it's intense, but like, it will actually be really good to get it off your plate. And he goes, don't bullshit a bullshitter. Why are we doing this? <laughs> and I go, it's because I lose the theater. <laughs> and he goes, thank you for your honesty. Um, and both things were true. Like, he was incredibly unburdened being able to do that early in the run. 
Um, but it also like set this template of like radical honesty between us in terms of like what needed to happen and and like how it was going to happen. And and it was it was it was a really great moment for us as a director and and uh, an actor. No, it, it shows. It shows. It shows. Oh, okay. Stephen Sondheim. Um, I mean, this has been quite a week mm. for, all, I mean, right? What he means to New Yorkers and to you and to myself and everybody in the world, the way he's touched um, the world. And to have him as, a, in a way, a cent very much a central character in this film, and beautifully played by Bradley Whitford, unbelievable. Mm. You know, Steve is like literally <laughs> channeling Yeah, Steve. I, I sent Bradley with the DVD of Lapine Six by Santan and I said, Come back with us on time. <laughs> I mean, it is fantastic. Yeah. Um, tell us what he meant to you, Oof. and how it, it, you know, and how important as a composer it means his approval. Clearly, in this film, it does. It's the thing that makes him continue to move forward. Yeah. So, tell us about that. Well, I, it's it's very it's very raw still, um, but you know it's because I was talking to him a week and a half ago. Like, yeah. that's, that's the part that's hard, is that, like, he was just here. Um, but, but something that I'm really proud of and was, was thinking about today was the fact that it's two legacies Steve leaves us, right? Like, and it actually is children and art. You know, he, he has this legacy of the work, which is immortal, of Sunday, Swing, and Pacific Overtures, and Assassins, and Company, and the list goes on and on. Um, and that is for time. Um, and and we honor that in this. We get to honor that with Sunday. But beautiful. we also honor the other legacy, which is he encouraged generations of playwrights. I mean, and when I tell you, John Mark Sherman plays Ira Weitzman in mm. this movie. John Mark Sherman was the first person to win Young Playwrights competition when he was 17 years old. Wow. He met Steve when he was 17 years old. Steve started that organization because he said if young people don't fall in love with theater and start writing for theater, we're going to lose it. Um, and Steve wrote that guy's college recommendation letter. Like, do you understand? Do, like the le And that's one of thousands, I'm sure you've all seen just on social media the past few weeks, how many of us have a letter back from Steve? And, and that's, the other, that's the other legacy he leaves us. And we get to honor that too in his voicemail um, to, <laughs> his voicemail to John, which was a real voicemail, and then a, a real voicemail that he recorded for us uh, wow. for the film. And so that was him. Wow. That, that's, that, that's his man. voice on it and, and his rewrite of it, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, of, uh, I think the original line was, I have a feeling you have a very bright future. He's like, I didn't really say that. <laughs> um, and uh, I, you know, I said, say, say whatever you want. <laughs> and, and he recorded this voicemail and, and texted it to me, and we just through it in, in the movie, and so I, I'm just really grateful that we get to honor both those legacies because I, it's you know it's going to be a race to see which is more profound: the legacies of artists he mentored and encouraged, or his immortal works. Wow. <laughs> so beautifully said, Lynn. You know, you have this beautiful piece on stage. How do you make it a film? How do you make it a film? What you, what what do you leave behind? What do you add? I mean, you're just telling me, which kind of freaked me out. Mm -hmm. That as I said, now. Was the song swimming? You know that beautiful sequence where he's swimming and he gets the idea for that that song, that missing song, and it, Lynn, it is so beautifully filmed, and when and when the lines of the pool become the staffs of the music sheet music, I, I mean, it's honestly you just wanna, it's just so brilliantly done, and so, so, tell us, and and so that, as an example. So, where did that song come from? Sure. So that was a song John performed in the show. That was a song in Boho Days, Tick, Tick, Boom, when he performed it as a rock monologue. He'd play it at the piano. And I, it was not in the off-Broadway version um, that I saw when I was 21 years old and that is done everywhere because it's kind of unstageable, right? It's the stream of consciousness song. But when I, when I went down to the Library of Congress and I heard it, I went, oh, this is about inspiration. This, this is very useful to us, and it is cinematic because cinema can move at the speed of thought in a way that, that staging, like traditional staging, can't really. And then it got taken to another level when we actually, our location manager found the pool he swam in. 
Wow. That's his pool. And time kept it free for us, just like it kept the Delacorte untouched for us, or Jonathan, or whoever kept it untouched for us. And when I got there and looked at the bottom of the pool and went, is it fucking staff paper? <laughs> like, it that, looks like, you know... Lynn, that is genius. You know, that is genius. I think that is genius. But that he looked at that and that he was doing those laps in that pool and looking at those five lines at the bottom of the pool. And the song actually only makes sense in that location. Lines like red stripe, green stripe, 50. Like, it doesn't mean anything <laughs> unless you were there. It feels like it was written for the film. Yeah. You know what I mean? Specifically for the film. I kept thinking, did Lynn write this? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't write anything but, for this film. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it just shows that you, that you as a creator, I mean, that you, f that you found that and decided to put that into this piece that's not normally there or was there in early uh, incarnations. It just shows that, y you know, y the creation of what you do is brought into this film. It's like, it's all of you. That's what's so beautiful. It's every part of you is on that screen. It is so exquisite. Um, what about a song like Green Green Dress, which of course mm. was, was well known from the piece itself, and then what happened? Did you have to... Yeah, we, we <laughs> filmed it, we cut it. I, as, we were, <laughs> as we were cutting it, I remember thinking, oh, this is gonna be uh, Congratulations 2.0, um, <laughs> which is Congratulations is a song I cut from Hamilton. And anytime people hear it, people go, why isn't this in the show? <laughs> it's good. I go, I know it's good, but it's standing in between who you, you and what you really wanna hear about, which is Eliza's reaction uh, to what just happened. And, and, and I felt the same way about Green Green Dress. We filmed it. Ryan Heffington did beautiful choreography to it. Um, and they danced all along that roof and they danced their way into the apartment. They danced their way into the bed. And then he hit the radio and then you heard Josh Henry's beautiful mm -hmm. early 90s R&B version of it. Um, and we were just waiting. I just felt like as beautiful as this is, I'm waiting for the next story moment wow. to happen. Um, was that a hard one for you or was it, or was it clear? Um, it was hard until I saw it without it, and then I went, I don't miss it. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to hear, because cause the song is about how much they love each other, and we know already. Right. Like, we just know, like, the right. scene's done so much it's of that work. It's not in the scene, right. Yeah. But see, that's what I mean, that you're able, as an author, to bring that to, as a filmmaker, which is an author as well, that's why it's all so connected, it's so beautiful. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I had um, I had lunch with, with Robert Rodriguez uh, before I started production on this, and he said the most encouraging thing, which is, you're not starting from zero when you direct this movie. Mm. You Everything you know about storytelling is also important here. You're just using different tools. Exactly and I, right. and I ch that was really empowering for me of like, okay, like what did I learn on writing these shows that I can bring to this? And one of the things I learned when you talk about framing is that, the opening number establishes the world that is like, you know, musical theater 101, <laughs> storytelling 101. But what I learned on Hamilton is that like every song is a chance to interrogate that relationship and expand it a little, mm. right? So like on our opening number, you're gonna say, we reserve the right to sing on stage, but we also reserve for Jonathan to break into song in his apartment if he wants to on the chorus. Absolutely. Um, yeah, but, but if the rule is when his hands are on the keys, we're in the world according to Jonathan, we can expand that by degrees with every sort of... But that's what we felt. We feel we're in such good hands. It's so confident, Lynn. That's what's so beautiful about the film. It's so confident. You know exactly what you're doing, and you're taking us there. You're not breaking the rules, and you're letting us follow it. It's just astonishing. Okay, I have to ask about Sunday because all of our friends mm. were in that piece. <laughs> so I want to know how that all came together, how you w reached out to the Broadway community to put together that astonishing, beautiful piece, so gorgeously shot. Yeah, I, 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 it just, it's sort of, it's a very funny song, um, like, full stop. Like, if you're just in the service industry, you relate to this song. Mm -hmm. um, and... It's an homage to one of the greatest end of act ones ever, which is when Surratt hears the cacophony of this community and goes, freeze, now this is the frame. And I realized that Jonathan only ever sang it alone at a piano and I have an opportunity to give him a choir. I have an opportunity to give him a Surratt tableau. So who am I gonna fill that with except his favorites, like his dream choir. And I wanted him to have sort of a larger galaxy brain moment of he's outside of time. He can pick his future collaborators with 
the rent trio over here. He can pick the, the, the show's influenced by his work. So here's some Janine Tesori with Chuck Cooper and Beth Malone, and here's the Skyler sisters mm -hmm. in the corner uh, over here. And, that, and then that to, was crazy when they were sitting there. Yeah. I was like, whoa. <laughs> but, but to me, the most important part, actually, as amazing as that was, and as amazing as it was to just see like Joel Gray just like talking to Andre <laughs> in the corner. Um, What's, what's really important is that he also then grabs his friend who is sick and puts him in the frame. Yeah. Because that's what he did. Mm -hmm. He said, and my work belongs here too. And my friends and my community mm -hmm. belong in this spectacle. And so he pulls Freddie out. We know Freddie's sick, but not now. Not in this perfect moment. Wow. Freddie's not sick. Freddie gets to stand and be a part of this choir. It's so um, and so that's, that's also the, the important gesture of it, that it's Jonathan's dream. You feel mm -hmm. that. You feel that leg. I mean, this is such a love letter to the creative process for people who don't know it, aren't inside it. And having been inside it, people that are, and I'm, I bet a lot of people here are from the theater, it's living in that tiny apartment, trying to <laughs> have a dream, right? And trying to find your way with a sagging bookcase. Just trying, <laughs> to, trying to see something that maybe could be there. And, and how does that connect to your, your beginning? <laughs> How long do you have? Huh? Um, no, well, it's, it's, it's interesting because I, we were talking about this a little bit before we came out, but when you're directing something, you just have to make more decisions than any one person can make. You, you have to make all, you know, every, every department is coming to you with questions about stuff, and you have to know the answers, and the answer is more often than not whatever your gut is. Um, and, and so as a result, you your stuff creeps into it. And I remember the first person I showed the rough cut to was, was Kiara, my co-writer on In the Heights, who's one of my best friends, and she's also one of my next door neighbors. She lives on my block wow. in Washington Heights, and I will love her forever, forever for this. But I called her and said, I have the rough cut. And she just said, I'm on my way over. <laughs> <laughs> I just ran down the block to, to come see it. And the first shot of Jonathan's apartment, she looked at me and she goes, Ming Wen Win that's your room, dude. <laughs> like, that's your futon on the floor. That's the keyboard next to the futon. That's the mess of food. Um, like, that's exactly what your room looked like. And I went, oh my God, it's so personal. <laughs> like, I kind of like burst into tears because you don't realize how personal it is until it's up there. Um, and in a lot of ways, it's the most personal thing I've ever done. Um, I'll never forget. Um, he gave me permission to tell the story so I can say it. But there's the, the therapy song in this movie, um, which is, um, I hope you saw that they both reach for the gun, fingerprints, um, all over it. There's a lot of Rob Marshall in that sequence. Um, and, um, but then there's the moment where you think they're gonna reconcile, and then he starts playing piano on her back. And I was screening the movie for my buddy Dave Malloy, uh, who's mm -hmm. a composer of Natasha Pierre. And when that happened, he went, Oh, <laughs> Lynn, you can't tell people that. <laughs> because it's such a kind of dirty secret about writers that, like, the mic's always hot with us. And there's a part of us, again, again, sometimes as at best, like, there's a part of you always standing by, mapping out a sky, finishing a hat. Mm. And, like, it's all fuel and it's all fair game. And, like, interact with us at your peril. <laughs> <laughs> As Lord put it, you will curse the day you kiss the writer in the dark. <laughs> well, it shows in every beautiful frame, Lynn. This is such an exquisite film, but it is astonishing um, that it's a, a directorial debut. Um, it is the beginning of an amazing career in that area as well. Mm -hmm. I'm so proud of you. Thank you. Thank you. Woo! Woo!